You are now welcome with Agile. kind of has a lane that we take and, and we keep here musically and sometimes you know it the flavor every month might change a little bit um, depending on the crowd because uh, you know we'll get like say maybe a, a birthday party of a hundred people or something and they'll all want to hear like more bouncy south shit so th that's not really our lane but at the same time we can't ignore you know a large portion of people like that so maybe we'll splash a little bit of that in but the stuff that trans translates to what we do Right, it's more soulful stuff, it's more uh, soulful hip-hop, R&B, soul music, uh, reggae, like more soulful reggae, not really the dance hall stuff. I mean, there seems to be a lane for us in Toronto, which is great. Um, we just kind of appreciate like having that lane and, you know, the crowd, the crowd taking our lead sometimes and following us, like, you know, like, I'll play records here all the time and risk. I'll just look over at Juan who's on the mic and I'm like, no response for this one, but I don't care. Like, I remember All of the Lights by Kanye came out two days before a main ingredient, and I played it. And there was like eight people going crazy, including me and Juan. And it's just that, I mean, like, it's just that forum for us. We like, we want to break records, we want to play records early and first. And we don't care if you don't know it yet, because we're going to play it here first. And maybe like a month or two later, you'll be like, oh, I heard that at main ingredient a month ago. So After I discovered samples, my boy Marlon, who became my manager later, um, he like introduced me to samples because I under, like I knew people were sampling, but I didn't understand. Like, um, like I knew "Can't Touch This" by MC Hammer was Rick James, I, uh, you know, Super Freak. I knew when when Marlon started showing me all like little snippets from different records, different breaks, it just kind of blew me away. I'm like, this is all coming from records? I'm like, because you know, all the producers were like, Molly Mall, who's a DJ, has a radio show, you know, DJ Pete Rock, DJ Premier. So all these DJs are making all this music. And I'm, you know, kind of like a light bulb went off in my head how the DJ and production kind of went together for hip hop. I'm like, oh, okay, this makes sense. So then, you know, I raided my parents' collection of records and my uncles and, you know, started with those old records and then started buying and going shopping with Marlon and Roland and digging for, for records. And, that's kind of how I got into production. I was, I was skeptical on doing a Dilla mixtape just because so many have been done. And I'm like, I just, I don't want to follow the herd, right? And then, you know, we brainstormed on ideas on how to do a Dilla mixtape. Like, you know, like, cool. So we decided um, we would show Dilla's influence. So we put together a mixtape with very little actual Dilla on the mixtape. If you, if you look at the track listing and listen to the songs, there's very few songs. Um, sometimes we use a few sound bites from him, some of his ad libs and stuff, we threw them in there, but the actual songs uh, aren't really Dilla. There's a couple of Dilla beats in there, but most of it's more his influence. We just tried to show a wide spectrum of the amount of artists from different genres that he, that he really influenced. And, um, yeah, that's how Toronto Love J came about. It was kind of like the mixtape to go at the party. And Stylus came around and people really liked it. And we did it in the style of Donuts, which was Dilla's last album that he did when he was live. And uh, we did it like that, like, you know, really abrupt cuts and, you know, everything on beat and stuff, but just um, non-conventional. So, yeah, Kyra Bot and I, we really worked on that hard and, yeah, we submitted it. And to, to my surprise, we won. I, I, I didn't think there was room for underground music anymore in, uh, in award shows. So it was kind of cool. Pete Rock started the whole shit for me and everything. His early works really got me, you know, into production and, you know, in that era they used to really talk about the equipment they were using in the music, which was kind of cool. So they would talk about, you know, putting the drums in the SP-1200 and sliding the sample in the S950 and stretching it. And I'm like, what are these things? And you know, you, you, there's no internet in, the, in this era, right? So you actually have to go to the music stores and what's the SP-1200? And they'd show you and how does it work? But I, I mean, I try to be complicated in a, in a simple way, you know, I just more layers and like more depth to my stuff. I, I think the job as the DJ is to play for the dance floor, first, first and foremost, right? You might think you're getting a highbrow crowd, and they show up and it's all pop people. They want to hear Katy Perry. 
I'm not gonna play Dilla for a Katy Perry crowd, right? To keep it real. Like, I mean, I'll be keeping it real and keeping my cred, but I mean, the dance floor will be the dance floor will be empty. So how dope am how dope am I on that day? You know what I mean? I, I always find a way. Like I mean, even if I'm playing like a corporate gig or something where you know maybe the, the playlist isn't you know my favorite, I still find a way to like still be me and play records that that I still want to hear and records that I like because there are pop, pop records that I like and there's good pop records especially some of the older ones right I saw sneaking some doobie brothers and you know what I mean some, some good there's good shit you know what I mean that you can play for that crowd and they'll like it right um, there's always there's always a way to still play good music still there's time enough to waste to assess and not lose face you flew at John.